Where the viaduct looms like a bird of doom As he ships and cracks Where secrets lie in the board of fires And the humming wires Yeah, man, you know you're never coming <laughs> they have never listened this far into the song. Uh, Nick Cave, The Bad Seeds, Red Right Hand, which features in Peaky Blinders and introduces my guests, stars of Peaky Blinders, Kelly Murphy and Helen McGrory, and the creator of Peaky Blinders, Stephen Knight. Hello, all. Good, Hello. Morning. Good morning. They speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> Right, I'm going to start with you, Stephen. Okay. So, um, you know, created by Stephen Nutt, it sounds great, and I'm mm. sure you did. But what was the what was the spark? What was the the first bit of it that you thought of? Yeah, I mean, it's been in my head for since I was a kid because it's based on characters and stories that were told to me when I was a kid. Because my parents grew up in Small Heath in Birmingham, and my mom was a when she was a child was a bookies runner because they used children to take bets because they were less likely to get arrested. And my dad's uncles were. Uh, racketeers and uh, illegal bookmakers who were known lo locally as the Peaky Blinders. Okay, but then where did the where did the look of it, the you know, for instance, like mm. the soundtrack, the yeah. the way it's shot, mm. was that all in your head, or was that other people? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's a collaboration uh, as ever. But the initial thought was that when these things were experienced by my parents, they were kids, so that everything was bigger in their memory. The horses were bigger, the men were more glamorous, the pubs were bigger. And then they told it to me when I was a kid, so it was doubly mythologised. And it was a very conscious thing not to remove the mythology. Let's not make this urban, gritty, isn't it a shame for these poor people? Let's just show this as a glamorous, attractive world. And so for Killian, Killian and Helen, when you get a script like that, because so much of this show is about you know, the, the the look of it, the feel of it, which is kind of really distinctive. How much of that was on the page when you kind of saw a script? Well, it was it was really, really strong. We uh, we both read the first two episodes of series one and it was really, really strong and completely unusual and very unique uh, for British telly, I certainly thought. I mean, it, and it had such an absurd title. You were going, what? <laughs> <laughs> this can't be good, but it, it was so good and so compelling. So it's just really the strength of the writing and the strength of the characters, really, for me. Yeah, but I, but I, but I know what you're saying. Actually, when you read the script, it didn't say how that it was going to look like a Western. Mm, and it yeah. was only when Otto Bathurst said, no, 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 we're not going to be filming this, as, as Steve says, you know, as sort of everybody feeling sad and sorry for these people. We're going to do what the Americans do so well, which is why shouldn't the working man on the street have the same sort of mythology as we've seen that Downton Abbey and everybody's done for the English upper classes? You know. And what's happened to the show, you know, because obviously series one, it's an untried thing. So have the budgets increased? Because, you know, I've seen episode one of this series, the third series, and it looks like, you know, no expense was spared. It looks, you know, massive. Uh, Killian and yeah. I work for free. Oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's on this. so good of you. <laughs> so, <laughs> you pay to go. <laughs> you laugh now. <laughs> but I think it, it is true. You couldn't have really made this show in this way even 10 years ago because technology's helped. But it's, you know, lots of expense has been spared. But we just try to try our hardest to put all of it onto the screen. But the great American mogul, uh, Harvey Weinstein, now, how did he get involved? Ooh, that's a question for you, Steve. He, um, he, he loved the show. He saw the first series and I think he saw bits of the second series and decided to take it on. It's very much his sort of thing. And I think that the response in the States has proven that it does have a universal appeal. And I think particularly in America, it, it's really struck a chord with a lot of people. Because uh, it's on Netflix there. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which, is, which has kind of changed telly because yeah. so when you are in when both of you uh, are in the states do you get people recognizing you from this rather than movies yeah, yeah in the states and other kind of bizarre places that you wouldn't expect i was in the czech republic and there are big fans of it over there and other places that the french love it yeah bizarrely. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um so yeah what, what, what's it called in france i would love to know <laughs> <laughs> the blind is peaky <laughs> 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 And for, the, and for the two of you, because there was a kind of... I guess life is changing now, sort of the world of acting is changing, because was it a big decision for both of you to say yes to a television series when you're probably thinking, ooh, actually, I want to do more films or whatever? Is, does, 
does that still exist, that slight snobbishness anymore? I don't think so. No, I, I, I think that um, American, the whole sort of box set generation now, of people being able to um, ha explore characters, as you said before, in a sort of much more novelistic way. Actors really want to do them now. Hollywood's full of people that want to do their own shows and have their own TV shows now. And you're right, that didn't exist ten years ago. No, you because you'd have, you, you'd have thought, oh, something's gone wrong. They're in a television series. Oh, dear. It's all oh, gone up for her. Yeah. not so clever now, are they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's some ads. <laughs> <laughs> and how? When did you film this? How long ago was was all this happening? The third one we just finished in January. So oh, so quick turnaround. Very, very quick this time. And you know, it's 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 six hours of telly. You know, so it's like three feature films, really. And you, we shot them in four months. Yeah. And it's a pretty intense schedule. Yeah, and then for the, the post-production, getting them all together and getting them out this quickly has been a real tribute to the, all those guys. And how does it work? Because there are big set pieces. I mean, big fight sequences and stuff like that. Presumably that takes a lot of rehearsal and preparation. Well, when you talk about the budget of it, I mean, for instance, the last shot in the series, in the last series, which obviously I can't say what it is, but it's a long tracking shot over about five pages. We had one take. Wow. That's a BBC budget for you. <laughs> yeah. So there are a few mistakes in it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A Vauxhall Viva drives by. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. And does anyone... Because you're now so successful, uh, do executives get involved? Do they say, oh, we want it to be more violent, less violent, we want more sex, less sex? The, the wonderful thing about working, and I'm not just saying this because this is BBC, but working with the BBC as opposed to working with studios in the States or TV companies in the States is you get very few notes. You only get notes when they're appropriate. People don't feel obliged to just say something because they're paid to do it. And so you do get left alone, especially as the writer, I get left alone. You know, the notes are minimal. There's no suggestion that we go in any particular direction. And it's that freedom, I think, that really you can see it on the screen, that you're free to innovate and to do stuff that's not expected. And, you know, when you started this, as you say, you had the idea, you want to tell the story of these characters. Mm -hmm. Can you see it now going on and on? Or will it, will it hit a, a wall? Well, I think it's good to have uh, a destination in mind, even if you, you're not sure you'll ever get there, because I wanted this to be the story of a family between two wars. And what I want to be the end of the very last episode is the first air raid siren of World War Two. OK, so well, that, you're doing well. It's only 1922 now, isn't I it? I know, we're going to yeah. have to start getting bigger jumps in <laughs> yeah. between. Come on, Julian Fellows. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years, yes, gone. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Bit of grey hair would be fun. <laughs> What's your commitment to it then, Killian and Helen? I mean, are you are you with it for life or? Well, I mean, it, it, I think it's as in, in insofar as the it still remains as appealing, character-wise and story-wise as it has done from the beginning. I mean, the writing is really, you know, fantastic. It really is. And and as actors, that's kind of what you do. You have a nose for good writing, and you follow that. And you know, if it stays that great, I'm I'm certainly in. I've got so, oh, someone's ripped some pages from a magazine. What magazine is this? Is it the Radio Times? The Radio Times, uh, which is all about uh, the extraordinary amount of celebrity fans. Celebrities. Mm. Celebrities. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but and uh, have they just have they made this up or is it no, true? No, no, no. It's, it's, it, it's been quite bizarre, really. I mean, there was um, I got contact by Dennis Lehane and Michael Mann saying they loved it, which was great, and then. Snoop Dogg's agent contacted my agent and said he's in London and he'd love to talk to, to me about Peaky Blinders. And I, I, I just couldn't get the connection, but we spent three hours in, the, in his hotel room as he talked about how... Are you all right now? I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. It was a while ago and I'm fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he was talking about how this series set in Birmingham in the 1920s reminded him of how he became involved in gang culture, which I find phenomenal. But if... People are seeing that. It's wonderful. And then since then, it's snowboard and, and pretty much anybody you, you've ever heard of is a fan. It's yeah, no, it's, they've got Tom Cruise and, and Julia Roberts. And, and Killian, was it, uh, did David Bowie get in touch with you? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I was aware that he was a fan. And then um, this is about Christmas, 18 months ago, he, uh, his assistant got in touch with me. And, and then I sent him, uh, I sent him the cap um, that I wore in the first series. That's as a, like a Christmas present. Oh, what a yeah. cool thing! Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, did you did you get to meet? Uh, yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. And he, yeah, he's genuine, genuine. Like he's a, such a sweet, such a sweet, brilliant man. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's very touching when people like that 
are into something that you're into when you're when they're an idol of yours since when you were a kid, you know. So it's yeah. very touching. And Helen, do, like you, do you guys get a say in the soundtrack? Do you hear songs and kind of think, "Ooh, I hope they use this," or or do you just kind of sit back and watch it on telly like everyone else and kind of go, "Oh, they use that song, did they?" Yeah, well, no, we sit back and watch it like everybody else, and we go, <laughs> "Oh, they look me make me look much better with that soundtrack." Behind me. <laughs> Why doesn't everyone play that when I'm going to the shops? <laughs> much cooler. <laughs> Delighted. Well, no, because, no. But the music is almost like a character in it. I mean, it's the soundtrack is so present. Mm. It, was that always the intention? Yeah, I mean, it, was, it, it didn't feel like a decision at the time, funnily enough. But I think because in 1919 there was no real contemporary music that would have worked in, in a contemporary drama. And it just feels that to have modern music means that the emotions that the people are feeling are the same as the emotions a modern person would feel and it takes away some of the distance where a lot of I think English or British period stuff the language that people use the music the way, the way people behave in a very mannered way does separate those characters from the everyday life of the people who are watching. And Killing, when you watch it, is it that thing that Helen was saying? You know, do you you think, oh, I thought I was conveying this, <laughs> but now they put that music on, it looks like I'm doing that. Um, well, that's the nature of acting generally. You go, ooh, I thought I was had a t totally different take on that. And then you see, you see it, and you kind of have to give over, I think, some creative control. But no, I really think it works. At the beginning, I thought it was a terrible idea, but then you see it and you go, it actually works amazingly well. You know? And a lot of the artists that are using the show, I'm a huge fan. Of, so it's really great to know that they've actually watched it and said, yes, please use the music. Yeah, and also they are brilliantly chosen, the tracks. I mean, in the, they don't seem that anachron anachronistic, mm. if that's the word. It's some of the word. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to shut up now. Uh, we turn now to listeners' questions. <clears throat> uh, uh, this first question is for Killian. It's from Bill in Edinburgh. I'm sure. I read you were once offered, oh my goodness, a five album recording contract. Do you have any regrets about not pursuing a music career? It's still got time. <laughs> I, He's yeah. a young man. Well, um, yeah, that is true. Um, but and, and and no, I don't. I don't have any regrets. Were you in a band at the time? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so it wasn't just you. It, it was, no, 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 no. It wasn't. It wasn't just me, and it wasn't a boy band either. It was a proper band. All right. Um, <laughs> 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 wow, that sounds like you were in a boy band and you're trying to distance yourself. I assure you, it was not a boy band. What was the name of the band? Uh, the Sons of Mr. Green Jeans. Oh, OK. Yeah. And, and yeah, but we were very, very young and uh, and it didn't really work. My brother was in the band and he was in, he was still in school, so my parents were not going to let the both of us no. go through that. So. Uh, Tony from Literally, this is a weird question. It is almost as if, kind of like, what did you mess up? Uh, it's sort of like, of all the characters you have played, which would you like to revisit again if you could? <laughs> yeah. Which is most disappointed? Yeah. Yeah. What were you the worst writer, in? <laughs> the writer, the audience, and yourself. <laughs> would you like to explain your career up to date, please, and apologise yeah. to the listeners? Why? Just why? Now, is, there some, is there a character you'd like to revisit that you, you enjoyed being most, I think? Um, I think that it was a positive question. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, something I'd like to revisit. I don't know if there is anything I'd like to revisit because I, I'm quite goldfish about work. Once I've done it, you know, that's it. I'm on to the next thing. But maybe, um, maybe Anna Karenina. Just, yeah. Yeah. Good, good coats and hats. And because, things. yeah, lovely, <laughs> exactly, lovely period. I do enjoy, you know, a little, a little going over to Poland and everything. How, but, how easy do you find being in a series like this? Coming, because this is, you do come back. You know, you go away, you do other things, and then you come back and do this show. Is it hard to pick it up again? No, it's great. You have all the advantages, and particularly doing any scenes with this man, because you just. Uh, have that trust that you have with um, somebody you know that's very good and nailing it and uh, you, you, you work very very quickly together there's a short there's a shorthand because you've worked together before which is just as well because you've only got four months to make six hours of telly so <laughs> <laughs> that's Handy. Uh, Kath from Hull. Mm. She's a regular correspondent. She has a question for you, Stephen. Uh, Cold Feet writer Mike Bullen and Foyle's war creator Anthony Horvitz have made cameo appearances in their TV series. Have you? No. 
God, I, d- I could. Think but there must be nothing. so many crowd scenes in this. You could easily ch- throw on an overcoat. I and... could throw an overcoat and a peak cap, but it would involve getting very cold and eating biscuits and bad food for at least two days. <laughs> if you're an extra, do you go to set at all? I do occasionally make a, a you know a dignified visit. Well, on lasagna? Day. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, but the, the, the life of a, a in the very early production, I, I coached some of my family to become extras, and they never forgave me. Uh, Phil and Liverpool, these questions are qu- quite a, a downturn, I think. Killian, <laughs> which of your other acting projects didn't get the love you thought it deserved? <laughs> this is like therapy. Wow. Oh, yeah. oh, dear. I feel so sad. Um, I, um, now, I, I, what would be useful if you named something that we could find on a Netflix or a, you know, something, something we can now go, you could recommend something and we'll go look okay. at it. Oh, um, oh, I don't know. Um... It's gosh, you can't. It's like what Helen said. You do you do a job and you forget it immediately, all about it, and you just move on to the next one. I don't know. Um, uh, this is a fil- film I did years ago called Intermission, which yes, I, just was, what I was. You know, it's, it's a great little movie. Um, What's that about now? It's, it's set in Dublin. Um, John Crowley directed it. Uh, it's a very good film. Yeah, but it's a long time ago. Intermission. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And was Breakfast on Pluto a big hit? Um, I, I don't know, really. Because um, that was great. I loved that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, you, don't, you don't really know these things as an actor. Yeah, they yeah. don't tell you. Just turn up at things. Well, as long as you get another job, you're thinking, <laughs> yeah. that must have gone OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is it. Yeah. Uh, Helen, which... I, 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 I'm just reading this. So I'm not even <laughs> going to second-guess what it is. Uh, which is harder or most challenging? Playing an imaginary character, um, like Narcissa Malfoy in Harry Potter, or someone who is real, like uh, Sherry Blair? That's Paul on Canvey Island. You know Paul on Canvey Island. Very well. Hello, Paul, again. <laughs> Um, I think it's much more difficult to play someone who really existed. I mean, like when I played Sherry Blair the first time, she had she hadn't written her um, book, and also Tony was still in number ten, so she wasn't allowed to say anything. She was always very quiet. There's a lot of photographs of her, but you never ever heard her open her mouth. So I looked at her like Richard Attenborough looks sort of like the apes. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Trying to work out why she did that, and you saw this smile all the time, which was basically the, her way of just not speaking and not disagreeing with what her husband was was saying at the time and then the second time I played her she'd written her book she she was you know on Radio 4 constantly everyone knew what she sounded like and it was much much more difficult because everybody went it's not what Helen McCrory <laughs> did in the Queen <laughs> <laughs> oh dear Sherry Blair's awful at being her she hasn't got her right at all have you ever played a real person Killeen um not someone I think that's still alive so, or famous. Uh, it's easy if they've never been on telly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I've not actually. I find that quite intimidating. I think that idea, and uh, yeah, no. So I've never done. It's just people that have are long dead and can't uh, oh, we, come we, after you. So I, 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 we've run out of time. We must shut up really quickly. Uh, thank you very much, Peaky Blinders. <laughs> uh, seriously, starts this Thursday, May fifth, at nine pm on BBC Two. Thank you for coming in. Thank, thank you. you. That was like filming. <laughs> If you'd like some more, why not check out my free download?